Amen. Take your Bibles, if you will. Turn with me to the book of John, chapter number three. John, chapter number three. Oh, thank you for being here once again tonight. What good music, orchestra, choir, special groups. That's a blessing to have good music. That offertory was a blessing. And uh, just the music program at our church. Brother Mike, you do a good job putting all that together. It's a blessing. And I'm very, very thankful. Brother Paul Sinerico and that orchestra. I love our orchestra. And they do a good, good job. The title of the message this evening is, He Must Increase, But I Must Decrease. He Must Increase, But I Must Decrease. I'm going to talk a lot about John the Baptist before we get to that and we read this first scripture. Uh, I remember my son Jonathan going down to Elizabeth City Baptist Church, and he, he's, he's worked right beside me for many, many years serving the Lord. Back when we did bus routes, he always helped out. Any ministry we've had, he's always been a blessing here at the church when I first came here 12 years ago. My son Jonathan, anything I needed, John would run and do it. He's been a blessing. And you know, now God called him to pastor. And uh, I, I went down there for the revival. Many of you went down there for the revival. I, I get there, and I'm not the pastor. He's the pastor. And uh, I got down there, and I'm seeing this and seeing that. I don't want to jump in, but I'm not the pastor. And, and I realized that he, Jonathan, needs, he's the pastor. He needs to increase. That's what he's doing. And then I need to decrease. In, in some areas, I need to not say anything. I need to keep my mouth closed because he's the pastor of that church. That's God's calling for his life. And we're going to read about John the Baptist. We're going to go in a lot more detail after we pray. But John the Baptist had a purpose. God sent him to be the forerunner to his son, Jesus Christ. And, whoa, he did that. He, he began to, to proclaim the king is coming, Jesus is coming. And sure enough, there he came. And he looked at Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John had been baptizing. And then you get to John chapter 3, and they find out that Jesus and his disciples are baptizing more than John the Baptist. Some begun to try to criticize Jesus and try to, to drive a wedge between John the Baptist's ministry and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And John the Baptist would have nothing to do with it. He says, You don't understand. And he says, he must increase, I must decrease. If we could stand, we're going to just read this one verse for now. After we pray, we're going to go over a lot of this. But we're going to just read that verse, John chapter 3, verse number 30. Are you ready? He must increase, but I must decrease. Let's say that two more times. He must increase, but I must decrease. One more time. He must increase, but I must decrease. Now, we're going to get to the Lord's Supper, and you're going to have to realize this is a message for you. It's a message for me. In reality, in our lives, he must increase, and I must decrease in every aspect. A mother, you know, it's, it's not about you. It's about him, and your job is being a mom. He must increase. I must decrease. You fathers, you're a husband. He must increase, I must decrease. Uh, you think about as a ministry in the nursery, working as an usher. It's not about you, it's about him. He must increase, I must decrease. We get to the Lord's Supper, you have to remember, the Christian life is not about you, it's about him. And he must increase, and the Lord's Supper helps you remember that you must decrease. Before we go any further, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, in your infinite wisdom, you put the Bible together perfectly, knowing that we would need these messages, these reminders. John the Baptist wasn't just speaking about himself, he was speaking about us in the future, and helping us to remind ourselves that, you yeah, know, it's not about us. It doesn't matter if he's baptizing more, none of that matters. He must increase, I must decrease. Help us as we get to the point of taking the Lord's Supper Help of all of us see how we can decrease and he, you can increase. We love you, Lord. Please bless in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated as you're sitting. Turn with me to John chapter number one. I want to go through a little bit 
of the life of the Lord, uh, of John the Baptist, just to get you a little bit more familiar with John the Baptist. And uh, John chapter one, I turn there, many of you are very familiar with the beginning of this chapter. It's hard to skip the first part of this glorious chapter. John chapter one, verse number one, in the beginning was the word, the, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of, of men. And once again, reference to Jesus, he's God. God in the flesh, as God created things, everything, Jesus was creating things because God and Jesus are one and the same. Praise God for that reminder. Hey, Jesus is God. By the way, as we get to verse number six, uh, Matthew, remember Matthew chapter three describing John the Baptist? John the Baptist, his raiment of camel's hair, and he had a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. And whoo, John the Baptist. We get a description here in John chapter one, verse six. Look at this. I'm gonna go through this. If you can skim and follow with me. Verse number six there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And this is not John the Beloved, this is the John the Baptist. Verse seven, the same came, why? For a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light. Hey, John the Baptist wasn't Jesus. John the Baptist was not the Christ. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Verse number nine, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And what an introduction. Hey, John has the privilege. He was sent from God. And he, what he's sent to be a witness to point people to the true light, the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God for that glorious ministry that John the Baptist had. Look at verse number 14. Once again, uh, speaking of the word, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hey, the word was with God. The word was God. He became flesh and dwelt among us. Praise God for that. Verse number 15, John, bear witness of him and cried saying, this was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me for he was before me. And what a ministry. He, he is the forerunner of Christ. He's pointing people to Christ. He is sent from God with a glorious ministry to say, hey, the, the Christ is coming, the Messiah is coming, the Lamb of God is coming. And it wasn't a ministry about John the Baptist. It was a ministry about the Lord Jesus Christ. What, what a privilege though, he was privileged. By the way, if you're a mom, you're privileged, privileged to be a mom. If you're a dad, you're very privileged to be a dad. You're a husband, you're privileged to be a husband. You're a wife, you're privileged to be a, a wife. If you're giving Pastor Brownies for his birthday, you're, well, no, that's not there. That, but you're, that's wonderful, that's a joy. How many got brownies for Pastor for his birthday? Brother Mike, thank you very much, I appreciate that. You're very privileged, make more though, okay? And uh, now we look at this. John the Baptist was privileged to serve the Lord, was he not? Look at verse number 19. And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? So these Jews, these priests, these Levites came to John. Who art thou? John, in verse number 20, he said, and he said, and he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. Then it'll get a little bit later and they asked him, what then, art thou Elias? And he said, I'm not. Uh, art thou that prophet? And he answered, no. Who art thou? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? Verse uh, uh, 23, he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the ways of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. Now, this is some details. We're going and reading these verses, trying to help you understand John the Baptist was very privileged. He was sent from God. He was to be a voice. He was to be the forerunner of Christ. He was not to lift up himself, but he was to point people to Jesus. Uh, look at verse number 24. 
And they which were sent, of, uh, were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said to him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, nor neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water. But there standeth one among you, whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latched I am not worthy to unloose. By the way, there's humility. There's a realization. John the Baptist is not trying to gain glory for himself. He's not trying to point a bunch of people to him. He's saying, listen, there's one coming after me. He's preferred before me. And you don't even understand the shoe latchet of whom I'm not even worthy to unloose. Look at verse number 29. The next day, John, John the Baptist, seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, behold, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said after me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And you can almost see the excitement. All of a sudden there's Jesus. He realized that's the one I was looking for. That's the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Verse 35, again the next day. After John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. Now, John had a, a glorious ministry. Can I just tell you, John, John was just a man. He's a sinner, he, but he had an amazing ministry. People came down to the Jordan River to hear him preach. And he lifted up his voice and he preached. His sermons weren't about himself, but they were pointing people to Jesus Christ. He was getting them prepared for the Christ, getting them prepared for the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And he preached, he preached. Yeah. Now, you fast forward, go to chapter three, if you will. And it goes into a little bit more detail. I want you to see this. John the Baptist, what a ministry. John the Baptist was privileged to, to preach. He was sent from God, a glorious ministry. Amen? Amen. Look at verse number 22, John chapter three, verse 22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. And there he tarried with them and baptized. So there Jesus is with his disciples. What's he doing? They're baptizing folks. They're giving the gospel and baptizing folks. Well, that's what John did. And here's Jesus, now the Lamb of God, He's got his disciples and they're baptizing. Look, look at verse number 13. And John also was baptizing in Enon near to Salem because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. Do you see that? Verse 24, for John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. Verse 26, and they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. You, you realize they're trying to cause divisions. John, you're not baptizing as many people as you used to. You're not gathering the crowds that you used to gather. You're not getting the attention you used to get. There's that Jesus whom you preached about. Now everybody's going to him and he's baptizing people now. And listen, the, the, uh, you gotta understand the same baptism, all men come to him. And you see the division there trying to happen. They're trying to, to draw a division between John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself slightly, but you and I, we have a ministry that God sent us to do. You know, if you're a mom, you're meant to be a mom. God gave you a baby. You're a father, God meant for you to be a father. Praise God, you've given a child. That's a glorious opportunity. Your husband, your wife, uh, we look at the, the privilege for me to be able to pastor. You get to sub, be a Sunday school teacher. You get to sing in the choir. You get to play a piano, work in the nursery. You get an usher. You're a grandfather. You have a privilege to influence your grandchildren. The list can go on and on. You're, you work. You work. Praise God for your ability to work and labor and make a living. Uh, there's all sorts of things that you're privileged to do in your life. And sometimes people want to draw a division. They want to say, well, you know, all of a sudden Jesus is taking more precedence than something. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Look at this again. John answered, and he's giving an answer here. He answered and said, 
a man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I, I'm, not that, the, I'm not the Christ, but that I'm sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, when he standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. Now I'm not gonna read the next verse in a moment, but he's saying, listen, you want me to be mad about him baptized? I, I was sent to bear witness of him. I was sent to, to point people to him. He's here. He's doing the work. This is good. This brings me joy. Boy, this, what you think should make me mad makes me happy. It's glorious. It's wonderful. It's fantastic. Then he hits the title of the sermon. He must increase, but I must decrease. That, that's a glorious truth. He must increase, but I must decrease decrease. Now, point number one on this, and I've got it slightly ahead of myself, but John, John never lost sight of who Jesus is. And I think this is a vital, important point. It took me a while to get there, but John the Baptist never lost sight of who Jesus is. Uh, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. Chapter 3, verse 28. Ye yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I'm sent, uh, that I am sent before him. And, and John the Baptist never lost sight of Jesus. Now, point sermon number one is we, as a church, you're a father, you're a mama, you're a, 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 even a child that's growing up in a Christian home, praise God, but never lose sight of who Jesus is. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. He's the one, as John chapter one, was in the beginning with God. He was God. He created everything. He's given you life and breath. And you're gonna see he's the Lamb of God. We're gonna get to the point where he was the Lamb of God, which taken away the sin of the world. He died on the cross for our sins. He's given us eternal life. Woo, he's a glorious God that we serve. John never lost sight of who Jesus is. Point two, John the Baptist knew that he must increase, but I must decrease. And you think, once again, I mentioned it, but God had a special plan for John the Baptist, a plan from birth, and we can read about that, a special plan. However, John the Baptist knew that the ministry that God gave him was not about himself. It was all about the Lamb of God, the Christ. He knew that he, must, uh, he the Lamb, must increase and I must decrease. The same truth is with our lives. As a father, he must increase, I must de decrease. Th this answers a lot of things. You wanna be a good dad, he must increase, and I must decrease. Uh, you wanna be a good mama, he must increase in your life, and I must decrease. You wanna be a good husband, well, you gotta die to yourself. The husband's to love his wife as Christ loved the church. How do you do that? He must increase, I must decrease. A wife is to submit to her husband. How can that be possible? Well, he must de increase, I must decrease. As a grandfather and a grandmother, you're trying to maybe even raise your grandchildren. The only way you can do that, he must increase, I must decrease. How can I be a good pastor? Well, there's only one way. He must increase, I must decrease. How can you be a good deacon? Well, he needs to increase in your life and you must decrease. How can you be a good Sunday school teacher? Well, it's my ability, my power. No, he must increase, I must decrease. How can you be a good soul winner? Soul winning has nothing to do with you and has everything to do with the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. So how are you a good soul winner? He must increase, you must decrease. How can you be a good cleaner in the church? Well, he must increase, I must decrease. How can you be a good usher? He must increase, I must decrease. How can you be a good bus worker? He must increase, I must decrease. How can you be a good nursery worker? Praise God for the nursery workers, they're servants. Well, he must increase, I must decrease. How can you be good in the choir? He must increase, I must, you get the point. That's a, an important point. I got a, uh, oh, a man in our church, Man, this is years and years ago, probably 10 years ago. And um, man, he, he, was, he, he had some money and uh, he looked sharp. He's an older man. And he said, Pastor, you need to give me something to do. And uh, he said, I have the ability to do something here. I'm here to be used and I want to do something in here. And I, you know, he didn't want to scrub no toilets. 
He didn't want to be an usher. And you could name about a hundred things he didn't want to do. And then all of a sudden, uh, uh, Pastor, you should let me get in front and get in the front of the, on the pulpit and I can read the missionary letters and put pressure on me and pressure on me. And, and finally, and I hate to admit it, but I gave in. And I said, okay, I'll let you read the missionary letters, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to read the missionary letters briefly and take less than five minutes to do that, please. And so he got up there and he read the missionary letter on a Wednesday night. And he read it and then he made a sermon. And the first time he went 20 minutes. And he went 20 minutes preaching a sermon. And I got done with that, I, I smiled, but that's not what I asked him to do. And I went to the brother and I said, sir, I'm not trying to be rude. I appreciate your willingness to be a blessing. However, I, I would like it if you would try to do the missionary letter in less than five minutes and do that. He said, oh, okay, pastor. The next week he got up there and he preached another sermon for 20 minutes. And so I, as the pastor, went back and I said, uh, you can't do that. If you do that again, we can't have you read the missionary letter. And he got angry. And, and, it, and it shocked me. And I, I, I don't, I'm not trying to, to downgrade this man, but he, he, he got angry. Don't you know who I am? Don't you know that what I said is good? Don't you know that they needed that truth? And, and it caused friction. And me approaching him, it was within just another week or so he left the church. And the pressure right there. But in, in his mind, and I'm not trying to be mean, the ministry was not about the Lord. It was all about him. And the Bible didn't send us to be masters and lords. The Bible says in John chapter 13, we're to be servants. How do we be a servant? He must increase, I must decrease. I remember another man came to church. This is years and years ago. And man, we had an amazing Sunday. There were like two souls that got saved and baptized. And we, we had a, a, a great day at church. I was so excited. And he visited and uh, praise the Lord, it was probably his second or third time he had visited our church and a fancy house. Uh, let me know that he made lots and lots of money and if he joined our church, he was gonna give liberally to our church. And then that Sunday night, we had two people saved and two people baptized. He said, Pastor, I need to talk to you. And I said, sir, okay. And I went to him and he says, Pastor, you don't understand. Uh, if you listen to me, I can show you how you can have a church that actually does something for God. And he went on and uh, on and on. And he made what had happened that morning and the miracle that had been happening in our church like God wasn't doing anything. And, and I, I, I said, I'm thankful for you trying to be a blessing. But, you know, I want to make you understand that I'm very thankful for the souls that got saved. I'm thankful for every member and person that's come to this church. And I happen to like what's going on at this church, happen to like what God's uh, doing behind the scenes with the people here. And you know what? He got mad at me. But the, the problem when I look back at it was he wanted a ministry that showed his ability, his uh, ability to do great things. And the, the answer is not that for me. The answer is he must increase and I must decrease. The Christian life's not about us, it's about him. Which leads to this, we know he must increase I must decrease. We get to the point, how can we do that? I, I mean, I want that. I want him to increase my life, but I also have a sinful flesh. You have a sinful flesh. And we want him to increase and me to decrease, but how is that possible? How can I do that? I remember in the Navy, I was in the Navy, I was the electronic technician. And we had a Xerox copier. And I, I went to Xerox copier school on how to fix a Xerox copier. And that Xerox copier would have glitches where it didn't work right every once in a while. And you know who they'd call? Me, the Xerox copier te tech. And I'd get there and I'd look at the machine and I'd say, what it's doing? This was not working. This is not working. I push this button. I say, okay, well, give me a few minutes. And I'd go to the back of the machine and turn the power button off. I'd count to seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Turn it back on. Hey, let's try it again. Push the button and the thing would work great. And that happened over and over. What'd you do? <laughs> Push the reset button. But, but our reset button, there, a reset button, there, there's times for us to put the reset button. 
our reset button on how to him increase in our life and us to decrease is found in the Lord's Supper. Do you understand that? God gave us a time to remind us how we can decrease and he can increase with the Lord's Supper. So if you'll go back with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is a great truth. It's a great truth. We know he must increase and I must decrease. But sometimes you men aren't loving your wives like you should. Your wife like you should, not your wives. <laughs> you better watch it. Sometimes you ladies are not as good to your husband like you should. Sometimes we're not in the ministry serving the Lord like we should. And we need to push the reset and remind ourselves what it's all about. It's all about him. He must increase, I must decrease. So we get to here, and I want to read verse, uh, verses 23 and 24 if you'll follow along with. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Read these next words with me. This do in remembrance of me. So reset button number one that God gives us is to simply remember the Lord's broken body. Try to think back and remember what he went through for you and me. He is that lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. But wow, you, you think about how Jesus, he's God in the flesh. He's helped so many people, healed uh, the, the lame. He caused the blind to see. He instructed people. He fed people. He helped people all throughout the region of Galilee and Judea and Jericho. He, he's God in the flesh. He's the Christ. Next thing you know, they betray him. They lead him away to the high priest. Next thing you know, the price, high priest finds some false accusers. They put a bag on his head, smack him in the head. They prophesy and they mock him. He's led to Pilate, and, and you know, the Jew, Jewish people rally against him. They say, give us Barabbas, and what are we to do with Jesus? Crucify him, crucify him. They, they scourged him and beat him, made his back to bleed. They placed a crown of thorns on, on his head right there. They mocked him, they bowed their knee, all oh, hail king of the Jews. And what they do, they led him to Golgotha, Calvary, and they killed him. And, you know, that, that piece of bread that we eat reminds us of what he went through, his broken body. Isaiah 53, verse 5, but he was wounded because he deserved it. Oh, he's wounded. Why? For our transgressions. Do you realize what he did for you? You're an imperfect person. I'm an imperfect person. We're a sinner destined to die and go to hell because of our sins. But he loved us. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised. Why? For our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. A reset button. A reset button. Mom, dad, grandpa, choir uh, member, nursery worker, whatever part of life God has put you in, a reset button on one, just remember the Lord's broken body. Remember he did that for you. He did that for me. Reset button number two. Look at verse number 25. After the same manner, also he took the cup, which he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. In what? remembrance of me. So number two, reset button number two is not only the remember the Lord's broken body, but remember the Lord's precious blood, the precious blood. And you know, we've preached messages on this, but in Leviticus chapter 17, it's a reminder. It says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Leviticus 17 verse 14, for it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. When Jesus shed his blood, he was giving his life for our life. That life, that blood represents life, his life. And that blood, when he gave his blood, his precious blood, what he's saying, he was giving his blood, his life, his life for our life. 
1 John chapter 1, verse 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, but God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Then it says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We sing that song we, after the Lord's Supper. I wanted to put the lyrics in the sermon tonight to help you think about what we're singing about. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Emmanuel, God with us, his veins. There is a fountain filled with that blood and, all, and, all, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. And we think about the blood. When you're, you're saved by the blood, you all of a sudden realize there's no hope in your works. There's no hope in your goodness. There's no hope in me. Your salvation's the same. He must increase. I must decrease. My only hope for heaven's not my works, not my goodness, not my baptism, not my church attendance. My only hope is Jesus, his precious blood. He must increase. I must decrease. The, the second verse, the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. There's hope. Though I'm a vile sinner, I have hope in his precious blood. And how? Why? Well, he must increase, I must decrease. Dear dying lamb, remember he's the lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed ones of God be saved to sin no more. Oh, that dying lamb, the lamb of, of God which taketh away the sin of the world, it's for everybody. It's not gonna lose its power. Ere since by faith I saw the stream, thy flowing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. He's looking back and saying, I remember when I trusted in that Lamb of God. I trusted in his precious blood. And when that happened, my redeeming love has been my theme. I'm now saved, but I'm going to live for the Lamb of God. That song saying, he must increase, I must decrease. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. And that's a wonderful, wonderful verse right there. Now, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Because reset button one, remember his broken body. Remember what he did for you. Remember reset button number two, his precious blood but we also have a warning, and it's a warning tonight about taking the Lord's Supper. Verse 27, Who, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the blood, body and blood of the Lord. But, and it gives us a solution. He said, watch out. You know, you're going to partake of the Lord's Supper you're going to take that bread and, and eat it. You're going to take that, that cup of juice and drink it. But if you take it unworthily, if you take it and there's something between you and the Savior, if there's something between you and the Lord, you have unconfessed sin. In other words, you're, you don't have a heart that's tender and right with the Lord. You, you know what I'm saying? Your relationship's not right with the Lord. And it's saying, don't do that. But it says how to handle it. It says, but let a man examine himself. Let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. In other words, it says, before you do it, stop and think about your relationship with the Lord. Are you having him increase and you decrease? Do you understand that? that that's so important as a church. We get so caught up. What I want to do, it's easy to do. What I desire. But no, before you take the Lord's Supper, it doesn't matter. It's like the Apostle Paul, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? It's like the Lord's Prayer, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's the same right there. He must increase, I must decrease. 
Then it gives us the other warning, verse number 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. That's a tremendous truth. When we take the Lord's Supper, it's not about looking and saying, look at the pastor's sins. They're there. Or your neighbor's sins, or your husband's sins, or your wife's sins, or your children's sin. It's to examine yourself. Hey, make sure that you're pure and right between the Lord. It's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my father, not my mother, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And that continues on and on. Let a man examine himself. You know, I've given this almost every Lord's Supper, but it gives us an example in Luke chapter 18. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, the other a publican. Hey, what's the Pharisee? He's a spiritual giant. <laughs> what's the publican? He's a wicked, rotten tax collector. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself, amen, he must increase. I must what? Decrease. Everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And praise God, the Lord's Supper, he must increase, I must decrease. How do, you, how do we do that? Well, let's press the reset button tonight. Some of you, in your mind, you might say, well, the answer is for me to not take a cup and not to eat the bread and drink the juice because, you know, I, I don't want to uh, drink it unworthily and then die or get sick. That's, that's not the answer. That's not what God desires at all. God desires for you just to get right with the Lord. That's the answer. And, and it's always been the answer. How does that happen? He must increase. I must decrease. Your will goes out the window. His will comes in the window. And it's important, we're gonna examine ourselves. We're gonna have an invitation in just a moment. And what am I inviting you to do? To examine your neighbor? No, to take a moment, pray and say, Lord, I wanna look at my life. I want my life to please you. I want to say like the Apostle Paul, <laughs> and praise God, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? You could think back over the last week, maybe the last month, maybe you have some unconfessed sin. You can say, Lord, please, Forgive me. Be like the public and have mercy on me, a sinner. He'll forgive you if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In 30 seconds, yes, in 30 seconds. That's how good God is. And you can do it at an invitation right now. And that's what I want to encourage you to do, to examine yourselves, make sure that your relationship was right with the Lord. And let's do this. And we'll stand with me, if you will. And... No piano, we don't need that. But let's take a few minutes. You can pray in your seat. You can come forward and pray. But take some time. Talk to the Lord as individuals. And boy, make sure your relationship's right. Let's do